hours later, the Coast Guard finds Jiro's wife and son, kilometers out to sea, clinging to debris. As dawn breaks, the tsunami's power becomes horrifically clear. Large parts of Aonai are completely flattened. Fires continue to rage, and most of the fishing fleet is lost. Across the island, 437 houses are destroyed and more than 800 severely damaged. 198 people are dead. The aftermath of the disaster confronts scientists with an intriguing mystery. The two waves that hit Aonai came from completely different directions. The first wave of the tsunami came from the west area where the seismic center was, and it attacked only the low part in the south area of Aonai. But the second wave came from the east, away from the tsunami's source. The second wave came in just 10 minutes after the first, and it attacked all of this area of Aonai. The first wave that hit the west coast of Okushiri came directly from the source. But then, just like in Hawaii, the tsunami wrapped around the island, creating a second wave that struck Aonai from the opposite direction. But the wraparound effect does not explain why the tsunami hit Okushiri with such brutal force. The reason is the extreme proximity of the event which created the tsunami. After a tsunami is generated, it radiates out like ripples on a pond. As the ripples expand wider and wider, the energy spreads out over a larger area. The closer the source of the tsunami is to the impact zone, the more concentrated the energy. Okushiri was only 80 kilometers from the source, so it received the full brunt of the tsunami. Just north of Aonai, the waves reached a staggering 31 meters. Today, the legacy of the 1993 tsunami is set in concrete. Huge walls up to 11 meters high and extending 14 kilometers along the coast stand guard against the sea. Powerful steel gates protect river mouths and the harbor is bolstered by concrete blocks to reduce wave impact. These ramparts against the waves are stronger than normal sea walls for good reason. The forces they must withstand are utterly different. Normal waves form through the transfer of energy from the wind to the ocean surface. Tsunamis are generated by phenomenal transfers of energy. Even the largest wind waves have a maximum wavelength from crest to crest of a few hundred meters. Tsunamis can have wavelengths of hundreds of kilometers. When they hit, they keep coming and coming. In a unique experiment, scientists in Japan are measuring the impact of those forces. At this lab in Kanagawa, engineers are using the largest man-made tsunami in the world to help design stronger coastal structures. This machine can generate waves more than three meters high, propelling 300 cubic meters of water down a 180 meter long chute. The best thing is to know the characteristics of the power of tsunami in each situation and build buildings according to those characteristics. Taro Arikawa leads a team that measures the power of tsunamis under controlled conditions. This tsunami is only two-thirds of a meter high, but it strikes with one ton per square meter of power. To demonstrate what that kind of power can do, Arikawa puts himself in the wave's line of fire. Without the rope and harness, he'd be swept away by this miniature tsunami. Bigger tsunamis are even more powerful. This 2.4 meter wave hits with the force of 10 tons per square meter. Even after the initial impact, it continues to surge forward with a sustained pressure of 4 tons per square meter. 
The tsunami in Okushiri was much higher and hundreds of times more powerful. Scientists here believe their studies will translate into stronger and better engineered structures capable of withstanding tsunami strikes. Once we can reduce the power, the reduced destructive power of tsunami coming ashore would not cause as much damage. The Okushiri event shows how destructive a local tsunami can be. It strikes with undiluted power and too quickly to respond. But that disaster was eclipsed by a far bigger and more deadly tsunami. A wave generated by an earthquake so powerful it moved the entire planet. A wave that takes us one step closer to a mega disaster. The tsunami that hit Okushiri, Japan, came from just 80 kilometers away and reached a run-up height of 31 meters. It killed 198 people and destroyed most of the fishing village of Aonai. But it pales in comparison to the deadliest tsunami of modern times. Seven fifty-eight a.m., December twenty-six, two thousand and four. Deep in the ocean off the coast of Sumatra, Indonesia, 1,200 kilometers of the Earth's crust ruptures in the second largest earthquake ever recorded. The 9.3 quake shatters buildings and destroys lives. But it is just a forerunner of an even more horrific disaster. An epic tsunami spreads across the entire Indian Ocean, striking 12 countries. As with Okushiri, Japan, the local effects are the most immediate and the most devastating. 16 minutes after the quake and 250 kilometers from its epicenter, northern Sumatra is struck by 35 meter high waves. The capital city of Banda Aceh is decimated. More than 160,000 people are killed. Coastal engineer Jose Borrero arrived in Banda Aceh four days behind the tsunami. I've seen hurricane damage uh, and I've seen some flood damage before and I've seen a lot of tsunami uh, after effects before also. But this definitely was the worst. What was amazing about it was the scale. 70% of all buildings in Banda Aceh are flattened. More than 70 kilometers of coastline show evidence of wave heights above 30 meters. It was a, a level of destruction that was, you know, over hundreds of miles of the coastline, the same level of destruction. So it wasn't just isolated pockets of areas that were wiped out, but the entire coast and then the entire city of Mandache. An hour and a half after Banda Aceh is leveled, the tsunami strikes Thailand. A wall of water swamps beachside villas, hotels and villages. That wave oh is a good 15, 20 feet tall. Easy. Get in, get in, get in. More than 8,000 people die. Two thousand kilometers to the west, on the island nation of Sri Lanka, one hundred billion tons of water surges inland, killing thirty-five thousand people and leaving another half million homeless. In all, nearly two hundred and thirty thousand people die in the most devastating tsunami in recorded history. The death toll higher than for all other major tsunamis in the past 300 years combined. The power of the earthquake that triggered the tsunami was staggering. The entire planet's sea level rose by a tenth of a millimeter. Every spot on Earth moved at least one centimeter. As scientists struggle to comprehend the enormity of the event, a bizarre anomaly comes to light one that took an additional tragic toll.
The morning of December 26 is quietly dawning on the peaceful shores of Gaul, Sri Lanka. British tourists Camilla and Dominic Welby are sleeping in their beachside bungalow with their 11-year-old son, Hector. Suddenly, Dominic is wakened by a strange noise. I went outside onto the veranda and I noticed that the water, which should have been at low tide, was up against the wall of the, uh, of the garden. What Dominic is seeing, without realizing it, is the first sign of the tsunami. At the point of its creation, the bottom of the tsunami, called the negative wave, went east towards Thailand and Indonesia, while the top, called the positive wave, went west towards Sri Lanka. When the bottom of a wave arrives first, gravity sucks the water out, lowering the sea level. When the top of a wave arrives first, it comes like a flood. This is what the Welbies are experiencing. I didn't know what it was. Um, and at that moment, the floor exploded. The tsunami rushes in, destroying the bungalow. The force of the water was phenomenal. You know, to, to, to be exploded out of your bed, you know, to feel a, a, a piece of furniture just be thrown up into the air and to be thrown off it and to have to jump. It's, it's just very weird. Um, and, and to then be sucked out and tossed around, like being in a, 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 a washing machine. The couple grab their son and scramble into the bathroom. With each wave, with the intensity of each wave, it would fill up the shower cubicle completely. We would be swirling around underwater, trying to you know, regain our purchase on whatever we could find. As the waves continue to pound, the concrete walls of the bathroom begin to crumble. Hector is trapped under a large piece of concrete, struggling to keep his head above water. The idea of your child dying before you is... it's nothing worse. A third wave surges over Hector's head. He's seconds from death. But instead of drowning him, miraculously, it lifts the concrete slab off his foot and releases him. The wave that's caused so much death in this one instance is life-saving. But mostly, the peculiar behavior of tsunami waves proves deadly. Surging forward and sucking back, billions of tons of swift-moving water carry a dangerous mass of deadly projectiles broken timber, glass, metal, and vehicles. The third wave turned Gaul into one of the hardest hit areas in the nation. As the people of Sri Lanka struggle to recover, tsunami scientists like James Goff arrive in the devastated nation. One of the really difficult things when you go into these areas is you are going there because you, you have a mission to learn about the tsunami from a scientific point of view. It's very important to learn these things, and yet there is the human tragedy going on around you, and it's very difficult to isolate yourself from that human tragedy. Amidst the horror, Goff and his colleagues discover the oddity of the third wave. So there's Gaul quietly sitting there, recovering from being hit by two waves, and then bang. How and why the Gaul area was hit by this third wave intrigued experts. Where did it come from? The first clue in the mystery was uncovered by looking at a global map. Sri Lanka is directly in the line of fire of the tsunami. Sri Lanka was basically staring down the barrel of a loaded gun in a way. The second clue came only after careful analysis of the tsunami's unique behavior. So the tsunami wave goes all the way past Sri Lanka, heading off to the east coast of Africa. But on the way, whack, it hits into the Maldives, and a lot of the energy is reflected back from the Maldives, and the first place that hits is Gaul. The tsunami was so powerful, its reflected energy carried a third wave 800 kilometers back across the Indian Ocean. In total, over 4,000 people died in the Gaul region. The tragedy confirms scientists' theories about the phenomenal reflective power of tsunamis. The Indian Ocean tsunami continues to provide scientists with complex and compelling new data, most of which is still being processed. 
It's really difficult to say right now what the Boxing Day tsunami taught us uh, compared to what we didn't know before, because it's taught us so much. It taught us that we actually don't know a lot and that we have a lot more to learn. What the Welbys learned is that life is fleeting and precious. In appreciation for their survival and in recognition of the thousands that did not, they spearheaded a fundraising effort back home in England. To date, they've raised $25,000 for the people of Gaul. Many mysteries about the Indian Ocean tsunami remain unanswered. One of the biggest questions is how the highest waves could possibly have reached a staggering run-up height of 35 meters. Far beyond what had been thought physically possible by an earthquake-triggered tsunami. But as huge as that tsunami was, it is not the biggest wave to strike in recent history. Landslides can trigger a different kind of killer wave, producing a tsunami of monstrous size. And scientists believe a mega tsunami looms in our future, a wave of such epic proportions that nothing like it has been seen since prehistoric times. The 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami unleashed a series of enormous and deadly waves that had run-ups of 35 meters. But they are dwarfed by another wave that forced scientists to become detectives. What they discovered was a new kind of tsunami, one of unimaginable size and power. In a remote bay in southwest Alaska, a native legend tells of a beast that shakes the ocean and destroys those who walk its shores. In 1958, a local fisherman came face to face with that beast. A mysterious wave more than twice the height of the Golden Gate Bridge. The story of this incredible phenomenon began five years earlier with two American geologists on assignment in remote Lituya Bay, Alaska. We were in the bay mapping the geology and primarily interested in the stratigraphy because of the oil potential of that part of the, of the Gulf of Alaska. They didn't find any oil, but they did find one of the scientific mysteries of the century. George Plafka was one of the scientists. One of the obvious things you see when you go, when, when you're in that bay, if you're looking closely, is that the trees are of different ages as you go away from the shoreline. Plavka and his colleague noticed that a band of younger trees circled the entire bay hundreds of meters above the water. The scientists knew this dramatic change in vegetation meant a large-scale disaster had struck the area. But they saw no evidence of fire or avalanches. And so we speculated about what that could be and had all kinds of ideas about uh, glaciers shoving forward very rapidly. Uh, the other was that there were submarine slides going on uh, at some of the deltas along the margin of the bay. Or that there was breakouts of large amounts of water up higher along the glaciers and then they flood down all of a sudden. Uh, we had everything except the right way <laughs> the right idea about how those waves could form. The geologists left Lituya Bay without solving their mystery. Five years later, they got their answer. In 1958, Howard Ulrich takes his eight-year-old son, Howard Jr., on a fishing trip to Lituya Bay. So, we went into our favorite anchoring spot and uh, and dropped our anchor and made supper and finally about nine o'clock uh, we uh, went to our bunks. An hour later, the boat starts shaking violently. An 8.3 earthquake centered 21 kilometers from Latuya Bay rips across the water. Howard and his son rush up on deck just in time to see the most amazing sight of their lives. 
it looked like a big explosion, like you, you've seen big explosions in the water on TV. That's exactly what it looked like. What happens next defies the imagination. As the spray started to settle down, uh, out of the bottom of it came this huge wave. I would say that the, the wave was close to a thousand feet high at that time, the actual wave. Traveling at an estimated 112 kilometers per hour, the liquid mountain is charging straight for Howard and his son. Just coal black and full of logs, and just straight up and down. It was a, actually a pretty horrifying looking sight. I just thought, you know, this is the, this is the end. There's no no way you're going to get out of this. So, you know. In a desperate attempt to keep control of his boat, Howard turns on his engine and drives directly into the beast. Started pulling all the anchor chain out, and when it got to the end of the chain, it just I thought it was going to pull the bow of the boat under, but it, it snapped that chain just like it wasn't even there. The giant wave lifts the tiny boat high into the air. So I looked out over the stern of the boat, and we were looking down on the trees. And I figured that's where we were going to end up. Unbelievably, their boat rides up and over the wave, and the Ulriches land back in the bay unharmed. Two other vessels and their four occupants are not as lucky. This incredible footage was filmed the next day. Everything in the wave's path is destroyed. No trees are left standing, and most soil is ripped off down to bedrock. The run-up height of 1,740 feet is the world record, I think, for anything that's happened in historic time. And uh, it was, uh, you know, it's 500 feet higher than the Empire State Building. That's, that's pretty big. <laughs> The earthquake felt by Howard triggered a massive rock slide, sending 30 million cubic meters of mountain hurtling into Latuya Bay. The debris slammed into the water, creating the giant wave. It just swooped down a very steep slope and ran out into the fjord and basically forced all the water out of that little arm uh, in front of the glacier and shot it up over the ridge that was on the other side. One mystery remained. The amount of water displaced exceeded the amount of land that fell into the bay. It took 42 years to solve this mystery. Scientific models determined that the rapidly moving landslide created an air pocket behind the wave, preventing the water from sloshing back. The force of the air pocket combined with the size and weight of the landslide shot the water out of the bay like a missile. It would be the same as if you, you know, you took a, a paddle and ran it down and pushed into the water full speed at, at a high velocity. Just shove, push all the water right out. The effects of the giant Latuya Bay wave remain clearly visible today. The event rewrote the history books and changed our understanding of tsunamis forever. Landslides can and do produce waves far larger and more destructive than ever thought possible. Latuya Bay's desolate location limited the damage caused by the giant tsunami. But should an even bigger landslide-generated wave strike a major city, the result will be a mega-disaster. In 1958, a landslide-generated tsunami, taller than the Empire State Building, obliterated an Alaskan inlet. It was a devastating display of nature's power. But across the Pacific Ocean, on the gentle slopes of Oahu, Hawaii, Scientists have uncovered evidence of a potential disaster that would dwarf the Indian Ocean and Latuya Bay tsunamis combined. It's almost incomprehensible, uh, the, the scale, uh, uh, the enormity of these things. Um, it would be quite a view. 
Gerard Fryer is a geophysicist from the University of Hawaii. He uses advanced computer modeling and field data to forecast tsunamis. His research has uncovered a potential wave so big that even the best laid evacuation plans may not be enough. These things have been described as, as culture-ending events. Um, the, the, the state would essentially be knocked back to the Stone Age. This mega-tsunami would combine the dizzying height of a landslide-triggered wave with a tsunami that strikes a densely populated landmass, in this case, Hawaii. On the island of Oahu, locals and tourists alike flock to the sea, soaking in the perfect climate and idyllic lifestyle of one of the most iconic coastlines on the planet. But in our scenario, everyone is oblivious to the fact that less than 480 kilometers to the east, a disaster of biblical proportions is about to strike. The mega disaster is triggered by the eruption of the world's largest volcano, Mauna Loa, on the big island of Hawaii. In the case of Mauna Loa, is, and, and that's the 800 pound gorilla here, that's, that's the big volcano that we have to worry about. As Mauna Loa is preparing for eruption, the southwest rift zone of Mauna Loa inflates with magma the entire mountain swells, which means that the outer slopes get steeper. There are probably a, a succession of small earthquakes and then maybe a big earthquake that shakes loose this very steep western flank of the volcano. Almost 1,500 cubic kilometers of earth and rock plummet into the sea. On impact, the land displaces a massive amount of water. The ocean rushes back to fill the giant gap. From this cataclysmic disturbance emerges the tsunami, heading directly for Honolulu. Estimated time to impact, 30 minutes. This is the direction that a, a big tsunami would come from, uh, from from the Big Island. The wave first becomes visible as it stands and breaks on a shallow bank, 40 kilometers southeast of Honolulu. You'd see the sea rear up in front of you. It would be huge. It would rise up above you the size of a building, the size of, of a, a 10-story building. Surging inland at up to 70 kilometers per hour, the tsunami slams Honolulu. Because the tsunami's energy stretches down to the ocean floor, this wave is not clean water. It's filled with sand, coral, and rock. Water penetrates 16 kilometers inland before being sucked back out to sea in a lethal maelstrom of wreckage. It annihilates nearly everyone and everything in its path. These giant landslides, as far as we can tell, they seem to occur during periods of high sea level when the climate is warm. Quite why that is, we don't know. Um, but we are in a warm period right now with high sea level. So we should expect something like this within the next 10 or 20,000 years. As the unofficial tsunami capital of the Pacific, Hawaii is preparing for the future. Scientists continue to develop a global network of warning systems based on real-time seismic analysis and deep-sea wave sensors. Alarms will sound as soon as 90 seconds after the initiation of even a small tsunami. Tsunamis are global-sized events with global ramifications. 
They combine the almost unlimited power of the Earth with the gargantuan might of the sea. They are a humbling reminder of the transience of man and the awesome strength of nature. While scientists learn more about tsunamis, engineers build stronger coastal barriers, and experts implement improved warning systems, individual vigilance remains essential. And you see the water withdrawing, strangely. Um, curiosity shouldn't compel you to go down and see what's going to happen next. The alarm bell should be going off. It's something that we need to have embedded in our culture, in our knowledge base, and in our education, so that we know what to do when the next tsunami happens. Not if, it's when. It's something we need to learn to live with. As long as we continue to have the phenomena that create these giant waves, we will continue to have tsunamis. It's just a matter of time before the next one strikes.